chapters 26 and 27 of a short history of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short History of the United States by Edward Channing. Chapter 26. The Era of Good Feeling, 1815 to 1824. 276. The Era as a Whole. The years 1815 to 24 have been called the Era of Good Feeling because there was no hard political fighting in all that time, at least not until the last year or two. In 1816, Monroe was elected president without much opposition. In 1820, he was re-elected president without any opposition whatever. Instead of fighting over politics, the people were busily employed in bringing vast regions of the West under cultivation and in founding great manufacturing industries in the East. They were also making roads and canals to connect the Western farms with the Eastern cities and factories. The later part of the era was a time of unbounded prosperity. Every now and then, some hard question would come up for discussion. Its settlement would be put off, or the matter would be compromised. In these years, the Federalist Party had disappeared, and the Republican Party split into factions. By 1824, the differences in the Republican Party had become so great that there was a sudden ending to the era of good feeling. 277. Western Immigration during the first few years of this period, the people of the older states on the sea coast felt very poor. The ship owners could no longer make great profits. For now there was peace in Europe, and European vessels competed with American vessels. Great quantities of British goods were sent to the United States and were sold at very low prices. The demand for American goods fell off. Mill owners closed their mills. Working men and women could find no work to do. The result was a great rush of immigrants from the older states on the seaboard to the new settlements in the West. In the West, the immigrants could buy land from the government at a very low rate, and, by working hard, could support themselves and their families. This westward movement was at its height in 1817. In the years 1816-19, to 19, four states were admitted to the Union. These were Indiana, 1816, Mississippi, 1817, Illinois, 1818, and Alabama, 1819. Some of the immigrants even crossed the Mississippi River and settled in Missouri and Arkansas. In 1819, they asked to be admitted to the Union as the state of Missouri, or given a territorial government under the name of Arkansas. The people of Maine also asked Congress to admit them to the Union as the state of Maine. 278 opposition to the admission of Missouri. Many people in the North opposed the admission of Missouri because the settlers of the proposed state were slaveholders. Missouri would be a slave state, and these Northerners did not want any more slave states. Originally, slavery had existed in all the old 13 states, but every state north of Maryland had before 1819 either put an end to slavery or had adopted some plan by which slavery would gradually come to an end. Slavery had been excluded from the Northwest by the famous Ordinance of 1787. In these ways, slavery had ceased to be a vital institution north of Maryland and Kentucky. Why should slavery be allowed west of the Mississippi River? Louisiana had been admitted as a slave state, 1812, but the admission of Louisiana had been provided for in the Treaty for the Purchase of Louisiana from France. The Southerners felt as strongly on the other side, they said that their slaves were their property, and they had a perfect right to take their property and settle on the land belonging to the nation. Having founded a slave state, it was only right that the state should be admitted to the Union. 279. The Missouri Compromise, 1820. When the question of the admission of Maine and Missouri came before Congress, the Senate was equally divided between the slave states and the free states but the majority of the House of Representatives was from the free states. The free states were growing faster than were the slave states, and would probably keep on growing faster. The majority from the free states in the House, therefore, would probably keep on increasing. If the free states obtained a majority in the Senate also, the Southerners would lose all control of the government. 
For these reasons, the Southerners would not consent to the admission of Maine as a free state unless at the same time Missouri was admitted as a slave state. After a long struggle, Maine and Missouri were both admitted, the one as a free state, the other as a slave state. But it was also agreed that all of the Louisiana Purchase north of the southern boundary of Missouri, with the single exception of the state of Missouri, should be free soil forever. This arrangement was called the Missouri Compromise. It was the work of Henry Clay. It was an event of great importance because it put off for 25 years the inevitable conflict over slavery. 280. The Florida Treaty, 1819. While this contest was going on, the United States bought of Spain a large tract of land admirably suited to Negro slavery. This was Florida. It belonged to Spain and was a refuge for all sorts of people, runaway Negroes, fugitive Indians, smugglers, and criminals of all kinds. Once in Florida, fugitives generally were safe, but they were not always safe. For instance, in 1818, General Jackson chased some fleeing Indians over the boundary. They sought refuge in a Spanish fort, and Jackson was obliged to take the fort as well as the Indians. This exploit made the Spaniards more willing to sell Florida. The price was five million dollars, but when it came to giving up the province, the Spaniards found great difficulty in keeping their promises. The treaty was made in 1819, but it was not until 1821 that Jackson, as governor of Florida, took possession of the new territory. Even then, the Spanish governor refused to hand over the record books, and Jackson had to shut him up in prison until he became more reasonable. 281. The Holy Alliance. Most of the people of the other Spanish colonies were rebelling against Spain, and there was a rebellion in Spain itself. There were rebellions in other European countries, as well as in Spain. In fact, there seemed to be a rebellious spirit nearly everywhere. This alarmed the European emperors and kings. With the exception of the British king, they joined together to put down rebellions. They called their union the Holy Alliance. They soon put the Spanish king back on his throne. Then they thought that they would send warships and soldiers across the Atlantic Ocean to crush the rebellions in the Spanish colonies. Now, the people of the United States sympathized with the Spanish colonists in their desire for independence. They also disliked the idea of Europeans interfering in American affairs. America for Americans was the cry. It also happened that Englishmen desired the freedom of the Spanish colonists. As her subjects, Spain would not let them buy English goods. But if they were free, they could buy goods wherever they pleased. The British government, therefore, proposed that the United States and Great Britain should join in a declaration that the Spanish colonies were independent states. John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, was Monroe's Secretary of State. He thought that this would not be a wise course to follow, because it might bring American affairs within European control. He was all the more anxious to prevent this entanglement as the Tsar of Russia was preparing to found colonies on the western coast of North America, and Adams wanted a free hand to deal with him. 282. The Monroe Doctrine, 1823. It was under these circumstances that President Monroe sent a message to Congress. In it, he stated that the policy of the United States at was as follows. 1. America is closed to colonization by any European power. 2. The United States have not interfered and will not interfere in European affairs. 3. The United States regard the extension of the system of the Holy Alliance to America as dangerous to the United States. And 4. The United States would regard the interference of the Holy Alliance in American affairs as an unfriendly act. This part of the message was written by Adams. He had had a long experience in diplomacy. He used the words, unfriendly act, as diplomatists use them when they mean that such an unfriendly act would be a cause for war. The British government also informed the Holy Allies that their interference in American affairs would be resented. The Holy Alliance gave over all idea of crushing the Spanish colonists, and the Tsar of Russia agreed to found no colony south of 54 degrees and 40 degrees north latitude. 283. Meaning of the Monroe Doctrine. 
the ideas contained in monroe's celebrated message to congress are always spoken of as the monroe doctrine most of these ideas were not invented by monroe or by adams many of them may be found in washington's neutrality proclamation in washington's farewell address in jefferson's inaugural address and in other documents what was new in monroe's message was that was the statement that european interference in american affairs would be looked upon by the united states as an unfriendly act leading to war european kings might crush out liberty in europe they might divide asia and africa among themselves they must not interfere in american affairs end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven new parties and new policies eighteen twenty four to eighteen twenty nine two eighty four end of the era of good feeling the era of good feeling came to a sudden ending in eighteen twenty four monroe's second term as president would end in eighteen twenty five he refused to be a candidate for re-election and thus following the example set by washington jefferson and madison monroe confirmed the custom of limiting the presidential term to eight years there was no lack of candidates to succeed him in his high office two eighty five john quincy adams first and foremost was john quincy adams of massachusetts he was monroe's secretary of state and this office had been a kind of stepping stone to the presidency monroe had been madison's secretary of state madison had been jefferson's secretary of state and jefferson had been washington's secretary of state although he was vice president when he was chosen to the first place john quincy adams was a statesman of great experience and of ability he was a man of the highest honor and intelligence he was nominated by the legislatures of massachusetts and of the other new england states 286 william h crawford besides adams two other members of monroe's cabinet wished to succeed their chief these were john c calhoun and william h crawford calhoun soon withdrew from the contest to accept the nomination of all the factions to the place of vice president crawford was from georgia and was secretary of the treasury as the head of that great department he controlled more appointments than all other members of the cabinet put together the habit of using public offices to reward political friends had begun in pennsylvania washington in his second term adams and jefferson had appointed to the office only members of their own party jefferson had also removed from office a few political opponents but there were great difficulties in the way of making removals crawford hit upon the plan of appointing officers for four years only congress at once fell in with the idea and passed the tenure of office act limiting appointments to four years crawford promptly used this new power to build up a strong political machine in the treasury department devoted to his personal advancement he was nominated for the presidency by a congressional caucus and became the regular candidate 287 clay and jackson two men outside of the cabinet were also put forward for monroe's high office these were andrew jackson of tennessee and henry clay of kentucky clay and calhoun had entered politics about the same time they had then believed in the same policy calhoun had abandoned his early ideas but clay held fast to the policy of nationalization he still favored internal improvements at the national expense he still favored the protective system he was the great peacemaker and tried by means of compromises to unite all parts of the union he loved his country and had unbounded faith in the american people the legislatures of kentucky and other states nominated him for the presidency the strongest man of all the candidates was andrew jackson the hero of new orleans he had never been prominent in politics but his warlike deeds had made his name and his strength familiar to the voters especially to those of the west he was a man of the people as none of his rivals were he stood for democracy and the union the legislatures of tennessee and other states nominated jackson for presidency two eighty eight adams chosen president eighteen twenty four the election was held the presidential electors met in their several states and cast their votes for president and vice president the ballots were brought to washington and were counted no candidate for the presidency had received a majority of all the votes cast jackson had more votes than any other candidate next came adams then crawford and last of all clay the house of representatives voting by states 
must choose one of the first three present. Clay, therefore, was out of the race. Clay and his friends believed in the same things that Adams and his friends believed in, and had slight sympathy with the views of Jackson or of Crawford. So they joined the Adams men and chose Adams president. The Jackson men were furious. They declared that the representatives had defeated the will of the people. 289. Misfortunes of Adams' Administration Adams's first mistake was the appointment of Clay as Secretary of State. It was a mistake because it gave the Jackson men a chance to assert that there had been a deal between Adams and Clay. They called Clay the Judas of the West. They said that the will of the people had been defeated by a corrupt bargain. These charges were repeated over and over again until many people really began to think there must be some reason for them. The Jackson men also most unjustly accused Adams of stealing the nation's money. The British government seized the opportunity of Adams's weak administration to close the West India ports to American shipping. 290. Early Tariffs Ever since 1789, manufacturers had been protected. The first tariff rates were very low, but the Embargo Act, the Non-Intercourse Law, and the War of 1812 put an end to the importation of foreign goods. Capitalists invested large amounts of money in cotton mills, woolen mills, and iron mills. With the return of peace in 1815, British merchants flooded the American markets with cheap goods. The manufacturers appealed to Congress for more protection, and Congress promptly passed a new Tariff Act, 1816. This increased the duties over the earlier laws, but it did not give the manufacturers all the protection that they desired. In 1824, another law was drawn up it raised the duty still higher. The Southerners opposed the passage of this last law, for they clearly saw that protection did them no good, but the Northerners and the Westerners were heartily in favor of the increased duties, and the law was passed. 291. The Tariff of Abominations, 1828. In 1828, another presidential election was to be held, the manufacturers thought that this would be a good time to ask for even higher protective duties because the politicians would not dare to oppose the passage of the law for fear of losing votes. The Jackson men hit upon a plan by which they would seem to favor higher duties while at the same time they were really opposing them. They therefore proposed high duties on manufactured goods. This would please the northern manufacturers. They proposed high duties on raw materials. This would please the western producers, but they thought that the manufacturers would oppose the final passage of the bill because the high duties on raw materials would injure them very much. The bill would fail to pass, and this would please the southern cotton growers. It was a very shrewd little plan, but it did not work. The manufacturers thought that it would be well at all events to have the high duties on manufactured goods. Perhaps they might before long secure the repeal of the duties on raw materials. The northern members of Congress voted for the bill, and it passed. 292. Jackson elected president, 1828. In the midst of all this discouragement as to foreign affairs, and this contest over the tariff, the presidential campaign of 1828 was held. Adams and Jackson were the only two candidates. Jackson was elected by a large majority of electoral votes, but Adams received only one vote less than he had received in 1824. The contest was very close in the two large states of Pennsylvania and New York. Had a few thousand more voters in those states cast their votes for Adams, the electoral votes of those states would have been given to him, and he would have been elected. It was fortunate that Jackson was chosen, for a great contest between the states and the national government was coming on. It was well that a man of Jackson's commanding strength and great popularity should be at the head of the government. End of chapter 27.